For this special episode for my playoff series, we are going to discuss the top 10 greatest performers for a game seven. However, since the NBA started to have all playoff series go to seven games in 2003, I will also look at how a player performed in the deciding fifth game in the first round and even the deciding third game, which was how the first round was decided in the NBA prior to the 1984 season. Before we begin, there are a few factors I have to mention to show which players could be eligible to make this list. First, you have to have played at least five deciding games to give us a large enough sample to see how a player performed under that extreme pressure. And lastly, obviously we'll be looking at not only how you performed, but also your record in deciding games. Take for example Will Chamberlain, who was in my opinion my biggest snub for this list. He averaged an impressive 29.9 points per game and 27.3 rebounds per game, and he went 6-5 and in playoff deciding games. However, what made me snub him from this list is that there was at least four different games where he, no pun intended, wilted in those games. For the most dominant score in NBA history was nowhere to be found in the most important game of his team season. When you have the reputation of not showing up in those big moments, can't put you in this list. The whole point of this list is to see who raises their game in these big moments, not who disappears. Let's get on with the list. At number 10, we have Dirk Nowitzki, who had a 5-1 record. He averaged 25.3 points per game on 46% shooting, 12 rebounds per game, and 1.5 assists per game. And here we can see the stat line of each game that he played on a Game 7. Now his only loss came in 2014 when at 35 years old, he took one of the greatest teams in NBA history, the San Antonio Spurs, to 7 games in the first round. It would be the last time he would face Tim Duncan and the Spurs in the playoffs. They faced each other six different times in the playoffs. And man, did they have some classic battles. We'll get to one of those battles shortly. But why the Dirk Nowitzki and Tim Duncan rivalry isn't considered one of the greatest rivalries in NBA history is a mystery to me. For some reason, people think that the Kevin Garnett and Tim Duncan rivalry was bigger they only face each other twice in the playoffs. It's whatever, but back to his only loss in the Game 7. He didn't play great, but that would be expected considering that he was already out of his prime. Now the reason why he barely makes the top 10 is because there was two different games where he didn't score over 20 points. In Game 5 of the first round series against the Utah Jazz in 2001, he only had 18 points on 3 of 11 shooting and just 4 rebounds. However, the Mavericks had an exciting comfort behind victory after being down by 14 in the 4th quarter. It's a game that I recommend any NBA fan to watch. For his first playoff series, playing in a very hostile environment, I gotta cut him some slack for that subpar performance. Then he only had 14 points in Game 7 of the 2005 first round series against the Houston Rockets. However, that didn't affect his team very much. Considering the fact that the Mavericks won by, let's see, 40 points. So those low scoring games by Dirk isn't too big of a deal. Now as far as his best Game 7 performances, you take for example his performance against the Sacramento Kings in 2003 of the second round series. He finished with 30 points on 60% shooting and 19 rebounds. We have to note that the Kings were without Chris Webber for the majority of the series. Now his best performance came in one of the greatest Game 7s in history. His showdown against the San Antonio Spurs on the road in 2006. He finished the game with 37 points on 55% shooting, 15 rebounds, 3 assists, 1 steal, and 1 block. What makes his performance from Dirk so epic is that he made the game time bucket with 21 seconds left after Manu Ginobili made the curious move to foul him on his drive to the basket to tie the game. He then made the game saving block on the other end 
to force overtime. Talk about an epic duel, especially since Tim Duncan had 41 points in this game. But unfortunately, it wasn't enough for the Spurs team. Dirk proved that he can come up big in high-pressure games. At number 9, we have Shaquille O'Neal, who had a record of 4-1. He averaged 27.4 points per game on 61% shooting, 12 rebounds per game, 2.8 assists per game, and 2.6 blocks per game. And here we can see the stat line of each game that he played on a Game 7. Now Shaq's high efficiency is what stands out the most with his numbers, as he only shot less than 55% once for the five total Game 7s he played. His only loss came in the Eastern Conference Finals against the defending champions Detroit Pistons in 2005. We also have to note that Dwayne Wade missed Game 6 due to a rib muscle injury. So Wade was very limited in Game 7, and it showed as he went scoreless for the final 15 minutes and scored 20 points on 35% shooting. Shaq single-handedly kept the Heat alive throughout the game, but no one else showed up in the fourth quarter. He finished the game with 27 points on 63% shooting, 9 rebounds, 3 blocks, 2 steals, and 1 assist. Not exactly a bad game for Shaq. And when you see his stat line for the five playoff decided games that he has played, you notice that he didn't have a single bad game. Now some might point to his Game 7 performance in 2000 against the Blazers when he had only 18 points. Now that one can easily be explained. It was a defensive game plan that nearly brought the Blazers all the way back from a 3-1 deficit. The Blazers would throw 3-4 to four people on Shaq at a time and they would dare the other unproven role players to step up. The photo on your screen is evidence of that. So in Game 7, the Blazers were either surrounding him with multiple defenders, or they were putting him in the free throw line if he was in position for an easy bucket. That is why he only had 9 field goal attempts and 12 free throw attempts. However, as you all very well know, it all worked out in the end, and Shaq came alive in the fourth quarter. He had 9 points on 3 of 3 shooting for the period, including the most iconic alley-oop dunk in NBA history. So that performance shouldn't penalize him enough to snub him out of the top 10. His best performance, though, will come in one of the greatest playoff series in NBA history, their 2002 matchup against the Sacramento Kings. On the road, Shaq had 35 points on 48% shooting, 13 rebounds, 4 blocks, and 2 assists. What's even more impressive with that stat line is he won 11 of 15 from the free throw line. Shaq would always say about his free throws, I always make them when it counts. And believe it or not, he would usually be right about that. With how scrappy these games are, and players struggling to make shots with how intense the games are, you can always count on Shaq to be aggressive in these games and to convert on high percentage shots. And he proved that throughout his career. Now number eight, we have Hakeem Olajuwon, who had a record of six and four. He averaged 25.5 points per game on 52% shooting, 12.6 rebounds per game, 3.6 assists per game, and 2.7 blocks per game. And here we can see the stat line of each game that he played on a game seven. Now Hakeem is highly regarded as the most skilled basketball player in NBA history. There's hard to find an area in his game where he didn't excel at. And when he was playing with his season on the line, he showcased every weapon he had in his arsenal. For example, we saw that in deciding game five against the Los Angeles Clippers in the first round, he had 31 points, 21 rebounds, seven blocks, three steals, and three assists. Or how about the game against the New York Knicks in the finals, when he had 25 points, 10 rebounds, seven assists, three blocks, and one steal. Talk about a player that is more than capable of doing it all when it counts on both ends of the floor. Now we see that he has a record of six and four in those final deciding playoff games. 
but he shouldn't get penalized too much for that. Two of those losses came when he was already over 35 years old. In fact, his last one in 2002 was actually the last game he played for his career at the age of 39. So it should be expected that he wouldn't be effective in those games. Then there was another loss in 85 when he was just a rookie. And even then, he showed that he was already the best player on the floor. His 32 points on 63% shooting, 14 rebounds, and 6 blocks are big time numbers, especially for a rookie. Then his loss in the 1993 semifinal series against the Seattle Supersonics, he had just 23 points. But for this specific game, the, the Sonics kept Hakeem's shot attempts low by doubling and trapping him all game long. So what did he do? He showcased his underrated playmaking abilities, and he had 9 assists for the game. The Rockets nearly won the game, but lost in overtime on the road. Now his best, now his best game that we want to highlight is Game 7 against Charles Barkley and the Phoenix Suns in 1994. He had 37 points on 55% shooting, 17 rebounds, 5 assists, and 3 blocks. Hakeem was just unstoppable on the block, as the Suns had no answer for his moves on the post. It was a big time performance, as it furthered his case as one of the best players you want under pressure moments. At number 7, we have Jerry West. He had a 5-6 and six record, and he averaged 29.8 points per game on 51% shooting, 7.8 rebounds per game, and then around 6.4 assists per game. Now there's an asterisk on those assists per game because for two of those playoff series, no assist was tallied for the game. And then here we can see the stat line of each game that he played on a game seven. Now he's the only player in this list to not have a winning record in game seven. But for him, I have a lot of sympathy. Three of those losses came in the hands of Bill Russell and the Boston Celtics. And as we'll see later in the list, beating Russell in the Game 7 was a near impossible task. But when we're talking about the team and the player that gave the Celtics the most trouble, it was Jerry West and the Los Angeles Lakers. In fact, Jerry West would perform his best when playing against his nemesis. Three of his most high scoring games in the Game 7 all came against the Boston Celtics. Take for instance Game 7 of the 1962 Finals, when he had 35 points on 47% shooting and 6 rebounds. With the rest of his teammates struggling, Jerry West was doing all he could to carry his team to the title. His running mate, Elgin Baylor, was having a hard time getting the ball into the basket. Although he had 41 points, he shot 13 of 40 from the field. And to show how bad the rest of the team was struggling, the Lakers shot 30% from the field if we exclude the numbers from Jerry West. So Jerry West was really doing his part to keep his team alive, and they nearly pulled it off. Frank Selvey had a golden opportunity to make the game-winning shot at the buzzer to win the championship, but he missed. It was an easy shot, and unfortunately for Frank Selvey, it's what he's most famous for, missing the game-winning shot to beat the Celtics. It's very similar to what we think of Bill Buckner of the Boston Red Sox because of his error in the 1986 World Series, but he gets it a lot worse. The Lakers would later lose that game in overtime. His best game, though, would also be the greatest Game 7 performance in the Finals in history. 42 points on 48% shooting, 13 rebounds and 12 assists in that 1969 Final Series against the Celtics. With Elgin Baylor struggling from the field and Will Chamberlain taking the grand total of 8 shots in the game, Jerry West did everything that he possibly could to carry this star-loaded team to the title. He fell short, but his performance was so amazing that he was still rewarded for the finals MVP, even though it came in a loss. 
He's one of the few rare exceptions where you can honestly say he is clutch, even if he has a losing track record. And the fact that he's been able to help his team win a game seven five different times and averaging almost 30 points per game with a high efficiency, that definitely makes him deserving of this spot. Now, number six, we have Kevin Durant. He had a three and two record. He averaged 36.2 points per game on 54% shooting, 7.6 rebounds per game, and 3.6 assists per game. And here we can see the stat line of each game that he played on a game seven. Now two of his victories came against Grind City, the Memphis Grizzlies, who prided themselves in playing tough, physical defense. Yeah, that didn't work against KD. In 2011, He scored 39 points on 52% shooting. And in 2014, he went for 33 points on 67% shooting, including going 5 of 5 from the three-point line. And that's the thing that stands out the most for KD. It's his efficiency. It's why he's regarded as one of the greatest individual scorers in NBA history. With the defensive intensity and the physicality that comes with playing the Game 7, The majority of the great players that you see that are not in this list didn't shoot with a high efficiency. It's to be expected, but the defenses just had no answer for Kevin Durant. They never do. So even though I snubbed him out of the top five because the players above him have a better record in Game 7 games, I will say this. He's probably the most reliable scorer that you will want in your team in that do or die setting in history. And that's saying something. He shot over 50% for four of the five games that he's played, excluding his most recent Game 7 performance against the Milwaukee Bucks this postseason, where he couldn't make a shot in overtime. Now for the two games that he lost, he's hardly to blame for his team not coming through. In 2016 against the Golden State Warriors, Everyone struggled from the field for the OKC Thunder except KD. His teammates shot a combined 24-70 from the field, or 34% shooting. Then against Milwaukee this postseason in the semifinals, James Harden laid yet another goose egg in the Game 7 and went 5-17 from the field. However, he was playing with basically one leg, so we shouldn't be too hard on him. So that meant that KD had to pick up the slack. And he went on to score the most points in a Game 7 in history. That also included that crazy game time bucket with one second remaining to force overtime. That is certainly not a bad way to lose. But T got the best of him in overtime. We all know this. But he had just a legendary performance that game. He has a strong case to be in the top 5 but I just can't put him over the next guy who had just as many legendary moments in the Game 7. Number 5, we have Sam Jones, who had a record of 9-0. He averaged 27.1 points per game on 50% shooting, 5.6 rebounds per game, and 1.9 assists per game. And here we can see the stat line of each game that he played on a Game 7. If you don't know who Sam Jones is, this is, in my opinion, the most important Celtics player behind only Bill Russell for the 60s era. Bob Cousy is the godfather of the point guard, and he was obviously an important piece to the Celtics. But he retired in 1963. John Havlicek was a better individual player than Sam Jones, but his biggest impact on the team didn't come until the late 60s. So to give an idea of how great Sam Jones was, if you were to ask any player from that era, hey, how great was Mr. Clutch? They'll look at you and ask, who are you talking about? Jerry West or Sam Jones? That's the reputation he had in the league. So let's prove how clutch he was for some of the biggest games of that era. We have his legendary moment in Game 7 of the Eastern Division Finals against the Philadelphia Warriors, which is what we essentially know now as the Conference Finals. And Sam Jones was the hero of the game, 
as he scored the game-winning shot over Will Chamberlain with two seconds left to help his team advance to the finals. He finished the game with 28 points on 41% shooting, 7 rebounds, and 2 assists. Then in the next round, against the Los Angeles Lakers in Game 7, he scored 5 of the Celtics' 10 points in overtime to put the Lakers away. His next great legendary moment came in 1963 against the Cincinnati Royals, where he would outduel the great Oscar Robertson in Game 7 in the Eastern Division Finals. The Big O had 43 points on 46% shooting, 6 rebounds, and 6 assists. Sam Jones, though, had the stat line of 47 points on 67% shooting, 7 rebounds, and 1 assist. That would be tied for the second highest points total for a Game 7 in NBA history. Then he also had a big game in the legendary 1965 Game 7 matchup against Will Chamberlain and the Philadelphia 76ers. You know, the... Game. We remember that iconic defensive play by John Havlicek, and we might even remember Bill Russell making some unforced turnovers that could have led to a rare Celtics meltdown. What many don't remember is that Sam Jones was huge for the Celtics in the offensive end, as he had a game-high 37 points on 48% shooting. So we can really see that the Celtics didn't have a cakewalk in their title runs. They've had plenty of close calls, and if it wasn't for the clutch play of Sam Jones, they could have potentially had a lot less titles. That factor, along with his huge contributions that led to the Celtics to never lose in a Game 7 if he was on the court, helped him be a top 5 performer in a Game 7. At number 4, we have Michael Jordan, who had a 4-1 record. He averaged 36.8 points per game on 49% shooting, 7.2 rebounds per game, and 6.6 assists per game. And here we can see the stat line of each game that he played on a Game 7. Now let's get one thing straight. This list isn't who's the most clutch player, but who's the player that you would most rather have in a Game 7. This is simply ranking who has performed the best in a Game 7 set. Players like MJ and KD simply didn't play enough Game 7 games for me to rank them above the players that are in my top 3. No knock against them. In fact, you can say it shows just how dominant they were in the postseason. MJ was so dominant in the postseason that he has only played in 3 Game 7s in his career. Once the 90s came around, Jordan the Bulls just wasted no time closing out teams in the playoffs. That was the type of killer that Michael Jordan was. Speaking of killers, he was known as the Cavs killer in the 80s, and he had some legendary moments against them in the playoffs. Most notably, the deciding fifth game of the first round in 1989. Jordan made what is known as the shot, as he made the hanging mid-range shot from the top of the key at the buzzard to end the series. He ended the game with 44 points on 53% shooting, 9 rebounds, 6 assists, and 1 steal. Another game that we want to point out is his Game 7 performance against the New York Knicks in 1992. The Knicks during this era were known as the Bad Boys 2, as they played a very physical style of play that was allowed in the league during that time. But for this game, Jordan was the aggressor, as he went to the paint time and time again to start out. It seemed like he was sending a message that any kind of physical play was not going to intimidate him from playing his game. And he was also dominant defensively, as he had three blocks and two steals to go along with his 42 points. And there are two games that Jordan seems to get penalized for. And one of them is his Game 7 performance against the Indiana Pacers in 98. He had 28 points on 9 of 25 shooting. He struggled from the field, as fatigue almost ended the last dance prematurely for Jordan and the Bulls. But just like we applaud LeBron James for having a great all-around game and 
having that legendary block in Game 7 against the Warriors in 2016, even though he shot 38% from the field, maybe it's fair that we do the same for MJ. He did have 9 rebounds and 8 assists in the game against the Pacers. He also gets lauded for willing his team in that 4th quarter and getting right to the teeth of the defense to get some much needed free throws. He also gets credit for some great defense he played on Reggie Miller. At the start of the fourth quarter, Phil Jackson made a defensive switch, as Ron Harper was the one chasing Reggie around all game. So with MJ guarding him, Reggie Miller was limited to just one shot attempt, and it came in a miss. So yeah, MJ was cold in this game, but he was still a big reason why his team was able to make it to the finals for a third straight year in a row. Then there's that Game 7 performance against the Pistons in 1990, where the Bulls lost by 19 points. And this one's easy to explain. Jordan scored 31 points on 48% shooting. The rest of the starting lineup, including BJ Armstrong, combined for 11 of 57 shooting. Or in other words, 19% shooting. Yeah, you're not winning a Game 7 when your team is struggling that bad. I don't care who you are. He gets a pass for that. So including all those factors, I see no reason to not have Jordan inside the top 5 greatest Game 7 performers. Number 3, we have Larry Bird, who had a record of 8-1. He averaged 29.1 points per game on 50% shooting, 9.7 9.7 rebounds per game and 7.3 assists per game. And here we can see the stat line of each game that he played on a game set. Now Larry Bird is known as one of the most clutch players in NBA history. With the game on the line, Larry Bird is in the short list of players that you will want with the ball in his hands. But it's not just the last second moments that has given him that reputation but also his performance in big playoff games. His record of 8-1 is a big reason why he's in the top 3 of the greatest Game 7 performers. And the degree of difficulty of these games are just through the roof. He had to go against Dr. J and the Sixers twice in a Game 7. The Lakers, the Bad Boys Pistons, Dominique Wilkins and the Hawks, Bernard King in his prime in the New York Knicks, And we can't forget about those Milwaukee Bucks teams that are easily one of the best teams of the 80s. All those tough matchups, and he only lost once in a Game 7. You gotta give it to him. Now some of his highlighted games are one, that legendary duel between him and Dominique Wilkins in 88. Dominique exploded for 47 points, and Larry Bird had 34 points on 63% shooting. But it was in the fourth quarter where Larry Bird made his mark in the game. He scored 20 total points in the fourth quarter, which included a two-minute stretch where he scored nine points. He helped the Celtics escape with a two-point victory. Then we have his classic performance against the Knicks in 84, where he had a triple-double. He ended the game with 39 points on 54% shooting, 12 rebounds, 10 assists, and 3 steals. Rory Sparrow, the Knicks point guard during that time, said this about his performance in a New York Times article, quote, You try to keep the ball out of his hands. He is such a creative player that it's difficult to keep him down. He makes so many positive things happen, and he does it almost as though he's a point guard. But if you play him as a guard, he posts you up. And if you play him as a forward, he creates other problems. End of quote. It's a great summary of Bird's game, and it shows why he is undoubtedly one of the 10 greatest players in history. We also have his first playoff classic game in 1981 against the Philadelphia 76ers. This particular Game 7 is easily one of the most intense and physical games we have ever seen. It was essentially rugby mixed with basketball. His classic moment came in the final moments of the game, where Larry Bird came down with the rebound and shot this leaner banker from 12 feet out to take the lead and the game. The 
with that shot, the Celtics were able to come all the way back for a 3-1 series deficit. And finally, we have his last great moment of his career in Game 5 of the first round series against the Indiana Pacers in 91. With about 4 minutes to play in the first half, Bird crashed the floor going after a loose ball in the backcourt. He stayed down there, almost paralyzed, then he had to go out of the game. And then, in the midway point of the third quarter, he comes back into the game. And Bird led Boston on a 33-14 run in the second half and helped the Celtics come from behind to beat the Pacers. He finished with 32 points on 63% shooting. And we have to remember that Bird was already going through intense back issues that led him to retire the following season. And according to NBA.com, the doctors told Bird that he probably had a concussion and they didn't think he should go out there with both the back and the damage he did to his brain. Even with all that, he was still able to have a legendary performance. Case in point, four of his most memorable performances of his career that we discussed came in a Game 7. Now how many players in the history of the sport can say that their best game came in a game with the most pressure and the highest stakes. Larry Legend, everyone. At number two, we have LeBron James, who had a 6-2 record. And he averaged 34.9 points per game on 49% shooting, 9.9 rebounds per game, and 5 assists per game. And here we can see the stat line of each game that he played on a game set. Do you remember the good old days when sports pundits used to criticize LeBron James for not being clutch or for not having that killer will? Yeah, LeBron squashed that narrative and became arguably the player that you most want to close out a playoff series in history. What gives him a strong case is the fact that his only two losses in the Game 7 came early in his career. The first one came in 2006 against the Detroit Pistons which was his first playoff run of his career. And he didn't play bad. Everyone else from his team did, but he was the only one that showed up for the Cavs. To give an idea of how bad the Cavs struggled in that game, LeBron only scored 27 points, and that nearly accounted for half of his team's points. Yeah, it was that bad. Now his second loss in the Game 7 would be one of the greatest duels in NBA history between him and Paul Pierce. LeBron James scored 45 points for the game, which would end up being the fourth highest point scored for a Game 7 in history. And may I remind you that this was against the team that would later win the title that postseason. And this is a team that is remembered as one of the greatest defensive teams in NBA history. And he nearly beat them by himself. Credit to Paul Pierce for saving his team season, as he would end up with 41 points for the game. And that would be the last time LeBron James would lose in a Game 7. In 2012, with his legacy on the line, after going through a humiliating defeat in the hands of the Mavericks in the 2011 Finals, he came up big against the Boston Celtics in Game 7 of the Conference Finals. Now he didn't shoot particularly well in that game, as he shot 43%, but in the fourth quarter, with the game tied, LeBron was able to close the Celtics out. He had 11 fourth quarter points. And give credit to Miami's big three, as they accounted for all of the Heat's 28 fourth quarter points. If people were saying at the time that the big three experiment would, would be a huge failure, if they were to lose again in the playoffs. But they stepped up big to help their team advance to the finals. What also helps his case to being the greatest Game 7 performer is that he had some legendary moments that happened in a finals Game 7. That gives him major points to putting him in this spot. We first have his performance in Game 7 of the 2013 Finals against the Spurs when he had 37 points on 47% shooting, 8 rebounds, 4 assists, 2 steals, and 1 block. That also included him going 5 of 10 from the 3. In previous years, 
teams would design their defenses to force LeBron to hit outside shots. And in the biggest game of the season, LeBron made the Spurs pay from the outside and proved that he was no longer an unreliable shooter. He also made the shot that sealed the game and the title for the Heat. With 20 seconds left in the game, he made a 19-footer to push the lead to four. Not exactly a game winner, but still a huge shot that killed any hope the Spurs had to win the game. Then we have his performance in Game 7 of the 2016 Finals against the Golden State Warriors. He was huge for the Cavaliers on both ends of the floor. We know about his all-around excellence, and the fact that he had the rare triple-double in the Finals Game 7 makes this specific performance that much more iconic. He is only the third player in history to record a triple-double in a Finals Game 7. But we also see how he impacted the game defensively. He had three blocks and two steals for the game. Speaking of impacting the game defensively, he also had one of the greatest defensive plays in NBA history. That block on Andre Iguodala with a minute 50 left in the game was a huge defensive stop that made the Warriors stay scoreless for the last four minutes and a half of the game. No, he wasn't very efficient, as he shot just 38% from the field, but he had some big-time plays and some big-time numbers in the biggest game for the city of Cleveland. That alone should be enough for anyone to put him either one or two in anyone's list of greatest Game 7 performers. But then he furthered his case even more in the 2018 playoffs. In the first round against the Indiana Pacers, he tied with himself for the fourth most points in the Game 7 with 45 points on 64% shooting, 8 rebounds, 7 assists, and 4 steals. Then in the conference finals against the Boston Celtics yet again, he had 35 points on 50% shooting, 15 rebounds, 9 assists, and 2 blocks. You're not going to find a player that did a better job in carrying his team all the way to the finals than what LeBron did in 2018. When his team was in the brink of elimination, he came up big time and time again. It's part of the greatness of LeBron James is why you can't say that LeBron James is in clutch. Now, number one, we have Bill Russell. He had a record of 10-0, and and he averaged 18.6 points per game on 46% shooting, 29.3 rebounds per game, and 3.7 assists per game. And here we can see the stat line of each game that he played on a Game 7. Look, we're talking about a player that is the best player in the team, and he goes for his career 5-0 in Game 7s. That would be enough evidence for anyone to say, you're not beating this guy with the season on the line. He's just too good. But 10-0? Like, what else can you say about that? Bill Russell was just too good. And if you want great moments, we have his rookie season. When in Game 7 of the Finals, he made the game-tying bucket that carried him into the stands, but somehow he was able to chase down Jack Coleman from behind and block him what would have been the game, wait, scratch that, the title-clinching layup. If you think LeBron James' block was the greatest offensive play in NBA history, think again. This play easily rivals that famous block from LeBron. When LeBron made that block, there was still plenty of basketball left to be played. That wasn't the case for this block by Russell. You can also point to his ridiculous stat line in Game 7 of the 1962 Finals against the Lakers when he had 30 points, 40 rebounds, 4 assists, and countless unrecorded block shots. Then against the Lakers once again in 1966. He had 25 points and 32 rebounds in that Game 7. Not bad for somebody who was just named the first player coach in league history. We can also point to the competition he faced and see that he beat Will Chamberlain 
four times in a game seven. And his points per game average against Bill Russell was a mere 21 points. Then we can see that he beat Jerry West and Elgin Baylor three times and Oscar Robertson one other time. These are four players who are in anyone's top 20 to 25 players of all time. Now if you point to his numbers and say, the dude didn't even average 20 points per game. How is that greatest of all time numbers? Well, there's a simple answer to that. To know Bill Russell's game, you have to first know his philosophy, the way he saw the game. So Bill Simmons wrote this great article about Bill Russell's leadership in 2012 for Grantland. And he said this about him, quote, Russell believed that a basketball team only achieves its potential if everyone embraces their role. You figure out what you have, split the responsibilities, and you're off. The less thinking, the better. End of quote. Then after talking about how Bill Russell and Bob Cousy were able to orchestrate the greatest fast break offense of their time, he then said this, quote, But that would have failed unless everyone embraced a role. And that's the thing. Everyone has to have a role. In Boston, Cousy ran the break. Heinsohn ran the lane and crashed the boards. Bill Sharman, Sam Jones, and later John Havlicek handled the scoring. Casey Jones and Sat Sanders handled the perimeter defense, and Russell handled everything else. So it was the everything else that varied from season to season, or even month to month. Russell assessed what his team needed and tailored his game accordingly. That's what made him Bill Russell. End of quote. So Bill Russell wasn't interested in scoring 25 to 30 points a night. That wasn't his job, nor would that have given the the Celtics the best chance in winning. That would have made his numbers look down much better, but he could care less about that. It was all about winning for him. So forget the stat that he went 11 and 1 in the finals. We can dive into that another day. The fact that he went 10-0 in Game 7 games is no accident. It's the culture that he built. It's the way he led his team in the most important game year after year after year. To bypass that stat just because he didn't score enough is something I'm not willing to do. He saw the game the right way. And his record of 10-0 is a testament of the greatness that is Bill Russell. And maybe he had it right all along. Thanks for listening.